Thank you, Nick. Uh, you were very generous with your kind remarks, uh, reminding me just how lucky I am that I have a career and friendships you so thoughtfully described, including for some weird reason, Dave Drobus, who said as I came up here to keep it short, the Emmys are on. <laughs> you did. <laughs> as I hope all of you know, I'm deeply grateful and more than just a little bit surprised to be chosen for this honor. For a kid from Remington, Indiana, population 1185, this is pretty humbling. I'm so lucky to have found my way to this profession. I have learned that working in public relations is worthy, even noble calling. And despite the inevitable headaches here and there, it can be a hell of a lot of fun. We get to meet and work with interesting people. We give voice to perspectives that deserve to be heard. And we have the awesome responsibility of providing counsel in both times of turmoil and sometimes even in times of triumph. We are dedicated to the proposition that good products, good service, and good people will prevail in the end. It's been my privilege to be part of that mission. Before I share some thoughts regarding our profession, I must sincerely thank Bill Nielsen, the Honors Committee, and the Board of Directors for selecting me as the 32nd inductee into the Page Hall of Fame. During my career, I've personally worked with or gotten to know 28 of the previous honorees. I suppose that's proof of both my good fortune and my getting a little long in the tooth. In my remarks of gratitude, I want to touch on three key themes, and they're going to be familiar uh, based on our conversations today and what you just heard from Jim. First, the need for greater awareness of public relations as a profession and a force for good the growing importance of increasing the business IQ among PR people, and the urgent demand for greater diversity in our field. As you know, these, those we serve rely on us to do more than simply amplify their messages. They want us to help discern issues and navigate pathways. That charge requires an astute grasp of the business models and goals, awareness of potential pitfalls, and an understanding of the ever-changing competitive landscape. In that regard, I share with my friend, the esteemed Professor O'Rourke, the need for greater business savvy in the PR skill set. If we fall short in that capacity, we risk seeing our roles commandeered by others who are more fluent in the language and actions of business. But while Jim would like to see more MBA majors hired in PR, I think that talented PR professionals can increase their own business savvy without necessarily earning that business degree. Indeed, I propose a much more economical solution. <laughs> Rather than spending those big bucks acquiring MBA, People could simply buy my book. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Jim. Uh, <laughs> couldn't resist that one. Uh, and as long as I'm shamelessly plugging away, I might mention that my co-author, Matt Regis, and I have just finished our second book together, Mastering Business. It features insights from 20 page members and their C-suite counterparts. By the way, it's out in December, just in time for holiday gift giving. Okay, enough of the sales pitches already. Uh, when word got out uh, at DePaul that I was receiving this award, my students uh, said, tell us the secret sauce behind 
why this happens and why, why this occurred. And, and what, what is the secret to your success? And I said, actually, it's quite simple. I follow the wise counsel of PR giant and our good friend who we honored this evening, the late Al Golan. Al often said, find a job you like and you'll never work a day in your life. Well, I've been blessed with finding many jobs I liked and in fact, most I have loved. In the flowchart of my career, though, I discovered a common theme. I suffer from the seven-year itch. Yeah, it wasn't any grand plan, but in general, I stayed in most of my jobs for seven years each. I never, I'll never forget the trauma of a big change I made very long ago telling my Hoosier parents that I was leaving Eli Lilly in Indianapolis and moving to Pitney Bowes in Stamford, Connecticut. They both cried. Not because I was moving to the East Coast, but because I was leaving a great company after seven years, just 23 years short of retirement. <laughs> Little did they know that timeline would pretty much become the norm for our industry. Why is that? Well, it's my hunch that it takes a year or two on the job to figure out what you're supposed to do, and a year or two to prove your value to the organization, and then a year or two of doing the job extremely well, and then restlessness sets in. Poof, seven years. I hasten to add, by the way, that the only place in my life where boredom has never set in is on the home front. Through cross-country moves and multiple job changes, the common thread holding everything together is the chief operating officer of my life, my personal COO, best friend, and wife of 46 years, Sandra Culp. And join us, joining us tonight are three other very special people in our lives. Our two sons, uh, Grant and Brad, his mother calls him Bradley, and our amazing daughter-in-law, Jamie. Please welcome them. For her part, Jamie finds it really hard to believe that I'm even standing here tonight. Indeed, that I'm standing anywhere. <laughs> Uh, Jamie's heard many stories about my near-death experiences as a rascal youth growing up on the Indiana Prairie. There was the time I climbed into a silo filled with soybeans, and I stepped into an air pocket that pulled me down like quicksand. I was drowning until one of my dad's workers discovered the boss's harebrained son and dug me out saving my life. And there are numerous other examples of reckless episodes growing up on the plains that she finds incredible, but maybe she can share with those with you perhaps over dinner or cocktails later. Suffice it to say, I've learned from these experiences and other life experiences, and I've hopefully grown and evolved in the process of reinventing myself each time. I have benefited both during those early years and throughout my career from mentors, friends, and colleagues who have provided guidance and opened numerous doors. Many of you are here tonight, including my longest time and dearest friends, Ann McCarthy, Bruce Weindrick, Bill Heyman, Merrill McDonald, Rich Jernstead, Dave Drobus, and many others in the room tonight. Friendships that grew out of business and were made stronger over the year, years, largely due to our involvement in the Arthur W. Page Society. While those personal relationships seem somewhat quaint in our overly overcomplicated world that is connected like never before, we must never forget their critical importance to our profession. Sadly, our society has can seem to be polarized in deep and sometimes antagonistic ways. We retreat to our own tribes 
and engage largely with people whose experiences and views mirror their own. For the sake of fairness and success, it's an imperative that we work harder to transcend these boundaries. As we heard in this afternoon's session on the hidden power of inclusion, we as senior counselors need to expand our roles to become leaders and advocates for diversity and inclusion. Well-intentioned organizations have been slow to turn talk into actions. However, for the first time in my long career, I can honestly feel at this point, we're on the verge of seeing genuine forward motion. Sister organizations to PAGE, the Institute for Public Relations, PRSA Foundation, the Planck Center, as well as several agencies and PR Week, have undertaken serious diversity and inclusion initiatives. They know forward motion is smart for business and it's the right thing to do. Simply put, diversity must be reflected in the ranks of leadership in our organizations or many talented individuals will exit or never even enter. An example of leadership, I would suggest, is Tarad Neptune. He's mandated that agencies responding to Lenovo's multi-billion dollar RFP must re reflect the diversity of the company's global employee and customer bases. Other brands are also requiring diversity and inclusion data. Agencies that lack staff diversity will undoubtedly lose out. When we hire individuals who don't look and think like the rest of the team, we also must make sure they feel at home. Become a mentor. Perhaps as important, invite them to mentor you. And on the mentoring front, college PR programs have an important role they really could use your help. Volunteer to speak in classes at area colleges and sign up for the Page Speakers Network, please. Each and every one of you in this room has the potential to be an extraordinarily influential role model in the classrooms. Reaching out can also go deeper, even to the high school level. Many kids have no idea what we do or what the initials PR actually stand for. Let me tell you about Juan, a Chicago high school junior, and Jasmine, a college senior from Auburn, Alabama. Juan and Jasmine attended two unique and promising programs I'd like to mention to you since they both, both the students and the programs, provide hope for the future of our profession. Besides being good students, Juan and Jasmine represent the sort of talent that is seriously underrepresented and will be needed in our professional ranks. First, the Planck Center has a, has a multitude of diversity and inclusion projects currently underway, including the challenge for emerging leaders. That's where I met Jasmine. With financial support from General Motors and Heyman Associates, the Planck Center created an intensive three-day leadership workshop, and this happened earlier this year, for racially diverse, high-achieving college seniors majoring in PR in Alabama and Mississippi. The pilot program provided students the opportunity to learn from some of the best professionals and academics in the industry including PAGE members Tony Cervone, Bill Heyman, and Dr. Bruce Berger. Students gained crucial insights about themselves. They elevated their conflict management and team building skills, and they acquired basic business knowledge. Student feedback surveys logged some of the highest scores I've ever seen. Black, white, and Latino students I talked with used terms like life-changing, and transformational as they describe their new understanding of the role and value 
of diversity and inclusion in our profession. Jazz, Jasmine summed it up beautifully, saying, she now looks forward to taking the industry by storm. Watching Jasmine and other students in the Future Leaders uh, uh, Challenge, really during their final presentations were, was so powerful, I immediately volunteered to help turn the pilot program into a series by hosting the next session in Chicago this November, thanks to support from Miller Coors and ConAgra. And a New York program is on the drawing board for next year, thanks to support from J&J. &J. Uh, thanks, Bill, again, for opening that door. The second program I'd like to mention is one hosted by Chicago's Midtown Education Foundation, PRSA Foundation, and DePaul. It's where I met Juan. You might be surprised to know I'd heard nothing about public, you might not be surprised to know I didn't know anything about public relations in my high school class of 51 back in Remington, Indiana. Some 50 years later in Chicago, neither had Juan. Juan and 124 other diverse students from 35 Chicago area schools were invited to DePaul this summer for a one-day crash course in public relations. How do the students react? In surveys, we saw double-digit increases in familiarity with the profession and favorability scores rocketed. Get this, after starting with a baseline of zero, 40% of the girls and 25% of the boys said they were now interested in exploring a possible career in this thing called public relations. A couple of innovative talent development programs, however, won't be enough. We must promote environments that embrace diverse perspectives and include broader backgrounds and beliefs. With support and encouragement from DeBall, I am in the process of carving out a program to devote more of my time to foster projects that address the crucial need for talent that is both diverse and inclusive. For me, come from, for me, coming during my seventh year at the university, this new focus may help me stay put this time. I look forward to sharing more about this with you as it develops. Friends, I could go on and on uh, with other thoughts and ideas about diversity and inclusion, subjects that are really something that I'm passionate about. But for now, let me just say what an incredible honor this award is to me. I know you share my belief that ours is an important, challenging, and rewarding profession that can become even greater. I believe Arthur Page himself would indeed be proud of how far we've come with the profession he helped define. And I can assure you that this small town kid from Indiana is honored and humbled by what the field of public relations and the beacon of the Page Principles have taught me in both life and career. Thank you very much. Thank you.